Mr. Speaker, much of what we enjoy today in Singapore is owed to the strong adherence to the rule of law. Judicial review by the Supreme Court represents an important tenet of the rule of law, that all power must have legal limits. In our Westminster-style government, executive action is generally reviewable by the judiciary, which is vested with judicial power under Article 93 of the Constitution. Article 4 of the Constitution states that any law enacted by this House which is inconsistent with the Constitution shall be void. Judicial review does not mean that the Court substitutes its decision for the Executive's decision. What it means is that the Court has a right to satisfy itself of the legality, rationality and procedural propriety of the Executive's decision. If it is not satisfied, it can strike down such action as being of no effect. In comparison, Parliament to which the Executive is accountable to does not have such a power, although it has other tools. Also structurally, the Executive is drawn from the majority of elected MPs in Parliament, a feature that Walter Bagehot referred to as the efficient secret of the English Constitution, upon which the Westminster-style government is based on. In Singapore, most government actions are subject to judicial review. For example, it is well established that the Minister's decision to detain a person under the Criminal Law Temporary Provisions Act in the interest of public safety, peace and good order is reviewable by the court in certain respects. It's noteworthy that even where public safety and peace are threat is recognised that the Minister's decisions based on such matters may be judicially reviewed by the court. This provides an important safeguard against abuse of power and strengthens the rule of law in Singapore. There are, however, a handful of statutes containing provisions that expressly restrict or exclude judicial review. In my speech, I will refer to these clauses as ouster clauses. The big elephant in the room is, of course, the ISA. Given the impact of such provisions on the rule of law, I think it's desirable that this House regularly conduct a review of the ouster clauses against current circumstances to ensure that continues to be a need for such exceptions to exist and strike an appropriate balance between efficiency and accountability. In my respectful view, it is important for each generation of political leaders and people to find their own equilibrium of what our people would accept without question, under what circumstances, and towards what ends. Fellow Singaporeans' desires and expectations are by no means static. Our Prime Minister in his speech as Secretary General of the PAP at his 36th Ordinary Party Conference in November 2020 acknowledged this. He stated that Singaporeans today have expressed a desire to, amongst others, re-examine basic assumptions, look beyond tried and tested ways of doing things, and have greater checks and balances. He also said that the PAP government must change and respond to these desires and expectations. Law derives its power not merely from the fact that it's enforceable by the state apparatus, but fundamentally from our people's willingness to accept the law and the authority of our institutions as legitimate. Today, our people trust all three pillars of our government to enact, use and enforce laws to ensure that we remain a fair and just, safe and secure society. We must not take this trust for granted. As members of this House, we are the people's representatives and part of the ecosystem that ensures that our people's acceptance of the legitimacy of laws and institutions. Before looking at the statutes in question, I think it is worthwhile mentioning that thus far, the government has taken a careful approach to clauses ousting judicial review. Even in relation to CLTPA, in respect of which honourable, mem honourable members may recall, the Court of Appeal issued a judgment quashing the Minister's detention order in 2015. The Honourable Minister, when he moved the bill in this House in 2018 to extend the validity of CLTPA by another five years, made it very clear that his decisions under the Act may continue to be judicially reviewed on the three established grounds. I read this as a deliberate decision on the part of the government to keep the exceptions to what it considers to be necessary in public interest. I commend this approach. With that, let me move straight to the ISA. I wish to state up front that I believe there remains a cogent basis to maintain the status quo for ISA. The ISA is an extraordinary piece of legislation that is aimed at ensuring Singapore's stability and security. I closely read the debate introducing the ouster clause in the ISA in 1989, particularly the speech of the then Minister for Home Affairs, the Honourable Professor S. Jayakumar. 
In a bitingly frank response to points made by honourable MPs, he recognised that there could be a prospect of powers under the ISA being misused. At the same time, he stated that ISA deals with issues where national security is involved, and putting a court to scrutinise exercise of powers will be tantamount to giving a court, an unelected body, the final say on such matters. That, in the scheme of things, is not desirable. In the result, the Parliament not only passed the legislation introducing the ouster clause in the ISA, but also introduced Article 1493 of the Constitution that expressly provides that nothing in Article 93 shall invalidate anti-subversion legislation, of which ISA is one. That is not to say that the Minister will be given a carte blanche. In lieu of court scrutiny, both the ISA and the Constitution prescribed safeguards, such as the involvement of an advisory body, board, and the elected president. There could be also be judicial review on the ground of non-compliance with procedural requirements under the ISA. In short, the ISA does not operate in darkness. There are checks and balances that involve, amongst others, the office of the elected president. Just a few weeks ago, we saw the Minister for Home Affairs exercise his detention power against a self-radicalized young person professing to be a Christian who planned to attack Muslims with a machete at two mosques. Fellow Singaporeans would have been greatly disturbed by this attempt to sow discord and hatred between religious groups here. This case demonstrates that the continued, the continued relevance of ISA against the context of the ever-growing threat of radicalization, extremism, and terrorism on our shores. The Honourable Minister for Home Affairs reminded us poignantly that these extremists have to succeed only once, but ISD has to succeed every single time. Having regard to all these circumstances, I do not advocate a rebalance in favour of more judicial scrutiny of executive action under the ISC. Outside the realm of national security, we have statutes that contain ulster clauses excluding judicial review. Most times, the parliamentary intention in enacting these ulster clauses is to allow the executive to move quickly and efficiently and make final dispositive decisions in national interest. Let me demonstrate this by referring to three statutes the Charities Act, the Immigration Act, and the Employment of Foreign Manpower Act. The general purpose of the Charities Act is to register charities and regulate the conduct of their fundraising activities. Under the Charities Act, the Commissioner has the powers to prohibit persons from conducting any fundraising if he is satisfied that the fundraising should not be conducted generally in public interest. His decision and that of the Minister in this regard is not subject to judicial review, save in relation to compliance with any procedural requirement. Senior Minister Theo, in his capacity as MOS Finance, explained in 1994, when moving the bill as follows, and I quote, Clause 40 will ensure that the merits of the decision cannot be reviewed. This is to avoid a situation where interested parties can, through the courts, frustrate government's decision to reject an application for a fundraising permit, unquote. Under the Immigration Act, the government has the power to deal with the immigration into and departure from Singapore. Exercise of such power, however, is not subject to judicial review. In justifying this position, the then Minister for Home Affairs, Professor Jayakumar, stated in 1993 as follows, and I quote, the intention of this amendment is that merits of the immigration decision, that is whether it is right or wrong, cannot be reviewed. It is to avoid a situation where the courts can frustrate government's decision to expel aliens under the Act or other immigration decisions concerning aliens." Unquote. Under the Employment of Foreign Manpower Act, decisions of the Minister and the Controller of Work Passes in relation to the issuance, suspension and revocation of work passes are not subject to judicial review. Dr. Ng Ngin, then the Minister for Manpower in 2007, explained his rationale as follows, and I quote, for consistency, certain provisions that are currently under the Immigration Act which are also replicated under this Act, including the exemption of decisions of the Minister and the Controller of Work Passes in relation to the issuance, suspension, and revocation of work passes from judicial review." Unquote. My concern here does not arise just because judicial review is ousted. I recognize there could be areas outside the realm of national security where it may well be desirable in the national interest for the executive to act quickly and efficiently. However, what is as important is that we need to ensure that powers vested by Parliament on the executive will not be abused. This 
will be consistent with Singaporeans' desire that there should be more checks and balances. We also need to explain to Singaporeans why a different approach is mandated when dealing with such matters, whereas when it comes to executive action on important matters such as public safety, peace and good order under the CLTPA, it may be judicially reviewed. Additionally, from time to time, powers vested in, with the executive under statutes that exclude ju judicial review may be used in an evolving variety of scenarios. For example, today under the Employment and Foreign Manpower Act, the controller of work permits and the minister use the powers not only to determine whether a non-Singaporean should or should not stay in Singapore, which was the focus of the debate in Parliament when the clause was first enacted. These powers are also used now vis-a-vis additional developments that has arisen in our local context to penalise employers who have failed to discharge their duties to ensure their employees comply with SHN requirements, breach the fair consideration framework, or treated workers unfairly when terminating their services, for example, disguised retrenchment. For these employers, MOM has withdrawn work pass privileges. In other words, the target of them, powers, are no longer aliens, but in certain situations may extend to Singapore-based businesses and companies. I have absolutely no quarrel with the invocation of these powers against such errant employers. However, given the variety of circumstances in which these powers are currently used, it would be a posit for Parliament to consider whether the original rationale behind the ouster clause should be extended to cover these new circumstances. Personally, I'm not convinced with the utility argument that has been advanced in Parliament to justify ouster clauses, that persons subject to executive orders may abuse the court's process by commencing unmeritorious judicial review action just to frustrate legitimate government action. I'll point out that that can happen even now, since there, are, there can be judicial review on the narrow ground of procedural propriety. More importantly, our court is well equipped to handle unmeritorious cases that amounts to abuse of process. This may be, amongst others, sanctioning not just the party, but the council representing the party. There is another reason why I think it's a good time to conduct the review of ouster clauses. There is a recent decision of the Supreme Court that we in this House should, should take note of. In 2019, a five-judge bench of the Court of Appeal handed down its decision in Nagendran. In that case, the appellant who was convicted for the capital offence of drug trafficking sought a judicial review of the public prosecutor's decision not to issue a certificate of cooperation to him. This has an impact on whether the appellant would be imposed a death sentence or have that substituted with life imprisonment. It was argued on behalf of the public prosecutor that the provision in the Misuse of Drugs Act allowing the public prosecutor the discretion to decide whether to issue the certificate of judicial review. In a unanimous decision, the court held that the provision which the public prosecutor relied on was not an ouster clause. Significantly, the court observed in, as obiter that if the clause was meant to exclude the court's jurisdiction, even if the public prosecutor exceeded his limits of power, that provision would be constitutionally suspect for being in violation of Article 93 as well as the principle of separation of powers. The court proceeded to review the public prosecutor's action and held there was no basis to interfere with this decision. As a result, the appeal was dismissed. I accept that the court in Nagendran did not decide on the validity of any ouster clause. However, given the reasoning of the court, this may be an opportune time for the government to review its position on ouster clauses in the name of good governance and the rule of law. In this regard, I quote the Honourable Chief Justice, who stated as follows extrajudicially, quote, in the final analysis, the robustness of the nation's rule of law framework depends greatly on how the other branches review view the judiciary and in, whether in turn is able to be, and willing to act honestly, competently and independently. Unquote. In conclusion, let me say that I'm fully aware of the advantage that comes with ensuring that our executive moves speedily, flexibly and effectively to decide matters in national interest. Our experience as a nation shows that such an ability on the part of the executive is vital given our country's well-known vulnerabilities. I also appreciate that the rule of law should not be viewed as a panacea but as a means to an end, which is to help to build a fair and just society, a system that works and a vibrant economy that will enable Singaporeans to realise their dreams. I'm not advocating a Western-style rule of law that may suit our circumstances. My basic concern is to address the desire of Singaporeans for greater checks and balances. For statutes containing ouster clauses that do not deal with issues of national security, I would suggest a review. It may well be that for these statutes, we may have to emulate the approach taken in the ISA or the CLTPA, or make relevant amendments to the Constitution to clarify the role of the judiciary in reviewing the ouster clauses passed by the legislature and the executive, executive quest, action in question. 
Ultimately, I believe that ensuring the sunlight of scrutiny on executive action, be it by the court or another high office, will strengthen the legitimacy of our laws. Our people will be able to rely on the authoritative findings of these institutions to satisfy themselves for the bona fides or otherwise of government action, and that there is indeed legal limits placed on the powers vested in the government. This is how the government should be held accountable. This is what rule of law means, and this is how we ensure a bright future for our country. Thank you.